All right, cool. So I wanted to have you guys on the podcast today to talk about your work, Strong Print 3D. You decided to purchase a printer from 20 out of manufacturing, but let's rewind before that. What first got you interested in 3D printed construction, construction automation, uh, bringing technology to the job site? Yeah, well, you know, I've been in, in doing uh, research and development for 40 years, and I've used uh, quite a bit of plastic 3D printing for making mock-ups and prototypes. And so I, I, when I heard about concrete uh, 3D printing, I thought, well, this is brilliant. You know, this is perfect for uh, construction. And I just thought I want to be part of this. And I'm actually retired, and I kind of came out of retirement to do this, which um, has been sort of a mixed mixed blessing. But but anyway, so then I I went to Twente, and uh, we sort of co-designed this machine that we that we now have the Intrepid. The Intrepid, okay, cool. I haven't heard of that one. I've seen the Tilikum printer they have. Is that a gantry system? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's the one that yes. Very nice. So. You said 40 years of R&D experience. What industry? Well, me mechanical engineering. I'm, I, most of it has been in lighting, actually, believe it or not. Uh, there's like a large scale fiber optic lighting and uh, solar lighting, like sun tracking, uh, solar lighting and other things mm -hmm. like that, as well as a lot of marine, marine hydraulics, underwater robotics, and a lot of different things I've been involved with. Yeah, you have cool. some patents. Yeah, yeah, I've got a few, about 14 patents with my name as well. And specifically research and development. So you were working with these technologies as they were emerging onto the market? Yes. Yeah. So I, I've always been interested in design and, and new stuff. You know, it's always like sort of like you, you know, I've been very interested in that. Yeah. How did you always keep up? Where did you see the new technologies arising from? Um, well, just just a lot of TED Talks, actually. But also when I was actually working, um, you know, full time, I, I would hear about stuff through through work, you know, through um, through through those connections. But but after I retired, I would more, more mostly heard about it through TED Talks, actually. Mm -hmm. And had you started a company prior to Strong Print 3D? Yeah, actually, two two companies. One was making. Um, an optical product that was actually based on using scrap material from the lighting company that I worked for. And the product was called the Rainbow Maker. And it made these beautiful big rainbows on the walls. And we, we, uh, we actually ended up selling the company to a, a company in Ottawa. And then um, I, another company was making uh, CD racks. And we actually sold um, a bunch of them through Walmart. And then, of course, that became obsolete once everything went digital. But there was a little period there where it was uh, working. So how did you guys team up? Um, well, uh, um, I was working for a friend of John on the geothermal greenhouses. Like, so just to be like a big one to be able yeah. to use food for all year long. And John came along checking this greenhouse, talking with his other friend John, say, hey, I'm doing that and I need someone to do that. And we start chatting about it. And I was very interesting about 3D printing new technology. So yeah, that's how we team up. So is there a distinction in responsibility between business side and technical side? Yeah, I would say yeah, John is more into all this business part and paperwork and everything. And I'm more into like technical part, like running the printer, Troubleshooting a lot on the software or the technical issues. Yeah. Loading the concrete bags into the mixer. Tell me, we didn't hear the loading concrete bags into the mixer. Actually, yeah. no, John is doing that. We... I'm, uh, I'm the one that loading the, the, the concrete into the hopper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 Intrepid, the way the Intrepid is set up right now, it's, it's using a, a hopper system on the, on the, the Z axis or the Z axis. And so we we mix it and then uh, and then we we literally dump it into the hopper by hand. We we need to upgrade that so it's more of an automated yeah with system the pump system. So we work we work together on that. Yeah, the hopper rests on the Z axis. Yes. So when you raise the axis, the hopper goes up with it, and the pressure doesn't build up in the hose. Well, no, there is no hose. For now, we um, remove the hose because we have some issue with no the hose. Pump. 
we're no, we're we're just using the the hopper has an auger in it. And if you know, and, and with the you know the videos you've made of different companies, quite a few of them use that system, right? Where the hopper moves around with the Z axis and it's fed out the bottom through using an auger. Sure. But then of course you can use a hose to fill the to fill the hopper, but it's not directly pumping out onto the layers. And then you have a separate mixer pump system with a hose feeding your hopper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right now we're doing it by hand, but the intention is to go that way. Yeah, we, we were doing it by using the MTech pump before, but the fact like we decided to push another type of material that was like from like, it's like stopping nick, so it's from the shelf, from Home Depot, wherever. And so it's way cheaper to do that and to use that mix and to use another one from Lafarge or other company. But the thing is like to push that for the MTech pump, it's almost impossible. Yeah, that brings us to a great point. And every company starts mixing generally from scratch. You developed your materials from scratch, which is fairly unique. I saw the Ian posted on LinkedIn that you had been working on your own material solutions. Uh, yeah. What has that process been like? And I know working with the materials, mixing it with uh, by hand, gives you better uh, control over all the parameters. We're not chemists, so I will say like we have a, like a small, like, a, like say like a knowledge about that, but- It's not easy for do, the chemists either. Like it's, a, it's like you're doing like, you know, like it's basically you try things and see how it goes and you try it on the time and you find the, the right one. John was very brilliant, so you know, he said like the mix is so expensive that it doesn't make any sense to, to build houses uh, with printing, like we need to, make something up it's going to be way cheaper and he's ready to get something like from wherever and it's working it's great yeah the mix the mix uh, there's a mix made by lafarge and also laticrete in connecticut and sika is now making a mix for for 3d printing but they're really expensive you know they're looking at something like a dollar a kilo for the dry mix and we we're working with stuff that's uh 42 cents a kilo and then we add we add a bit of additives to it, but it's you know I mean our my whole focus or our, our whole focus has been on on building making buildings economically because otherwise it's, there's no advantage much to 3D printing other than quicker quicker production but there's no cost advantage unless you can use a low cost mix. Yeah, the the material is definitely a big expense. How long did it take to develop the material? Oh, just a few weeks. Um, yeah. It's mainly we're using an off-the-shelf material, but we're adding stuff to it. Yeah. So uh, we're you know it's it, that we just experimented a little bit with different quantities, and of course, as you know, uh, with accelerator, which is one of the additives, um, it it's very very sensitive to temperature. So um, on a warm day, you have to add almost nothing, and on a, on a cold day, you have to add a lot. <laughs> so it's it's very, very sensitive to temperature. Certainly, that causes a lot of trouble printing throughout the day if the sun comes out or new regions uh, in different groups. In your prints, were they on site or off site? On site. On site. And so, how did the weather challenges go? I saw your layer quality was pretty good. Yeah, but even with the weather challenge, we quite did well. The, the worst, for example, of like you have one side exposed to the sun and the other side in the shed. And this is horrible because one side you can build up fast and the other one you can't. So you have to, to really like think of that. So yeah, that's, um, we make it happen, but the, we can upgrade the printer to make it like even better with a system to cover it and to have a control environment almost as much as possible. Yeah, we can we can work better on that, but already it's debatable whether a tent is a upgrade or a downgrade from a cost perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, a full tent enclosure would be ideal, but even just a shade, even just a sunshade, would be uh, would make quite a big difference. Yeah, a lot of teams print at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like on the summer night, it's probably the best moment to do it. <laughs> yeah. In Ontario, have you tried printing in the cold, uh, in freezing temperatures? We try to print on very, not freezing temperature, but like about zero, two degrees. And depending on the mix you use, it's possible. It's more challenging because you have to be very, very focusing on the layer if they don't like uh, start to mess up. 
yeah. and like yeah like we tried different mix uh, one from what was multi well for multi we which, had a mix from multi creek was very is, good which in winnipeg and that, that stuff worked really well in cold weather yeah very well but the um the other stuff we're using didn't didn't do well in cold weather it just didn't mm -hmm. cure so the biggest building you've done so far was the 10 foot by 20 foot agricultural building right yes how what other what's the next biggest structure you've completed small house that would be the uh, next thing to oh, do well you mean no you mean what have we done what have we done, we, oh, we have they, done they, no. the other thing we did we did a wall that's about um 15 feet long by about six or six feet high yeah with a uh, pattern i saw yeah yeah they, they, but that's it those are the, the two and then we did a cylinder that's about three feet in diameter and four feet cool. high so the that's, next and then we did the, sorry Go ahead. oh well then other than that there's those tilt up uh ladders you know the signage ladder but that's not uh, for now yeah, yeah we want to print a small house too because yeah. now we know we can do it we, like we so do for the house stuff so yeah will you have a client on that project or will you it's coming it? yeah we have some contact with see how it goes so yeah, yeah yeah like since we make this video like a few a week ago like we start to have way more like uh, contact with people and many people are very interesting about it a lot of people actually <laughs> so yeah. yeah you should make yeah. a lot more videos the more you make the better uh i tell companies that all the time and yeah. so many just don't film their work but when you do it's great people respond to you you get good results isn't it uh I mean, it's amazing. The algorithms just find a good audience for you. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Hmm. that's that's we're not very into social media. That's the truth. So we probably need to make get someone like to be more like to just describe. But yeah, no, yeah, you're right. I wasn't into social media either. I just bought a camera when I was in China because Winsun told me they'd let me visit their uh, print facility and. Uh, kind of like the way your video, you weren't expecting anything to happen. People watched it. You got a good response uh and then it was the beginning of something good for your next project the house will you pursue permitting for the house print well yeah well so so we've i've actually yeah. done a lot of work with a structural engineer uh who and we have a he pretty much has designed what we need to do for a house the house would consist of eight columns mm -hmm. that are structural with rebar in them and then the frame uh the the, the footings would be uh what he calls grade beams, which carry the the moment, uh, you know, in, under the ground and back up the other column. So we we've we've got it designed that way structurally, and he's per perfectly prepared to sign off on on a house. Um, we just don't know. Our next client may be happy to build one without a permit, or maybe hopefully we'll do it with a permit because that's way better uh, publicity to have a permit. So we hopefully we will do that. In Ontario. I don't really know that part of Canada very well, but is it remote enough that many people build things without permits? Well, well we're in British Columbia. And the the truth is that um, where we live on this island, there's a, quite a lot of stuff is done without permits, but yeah. it's not legal. I mean, people just do it anyway. Um, there are certain places in this province where you are allowed to build stuff without permits, like on an off-grid island, for example. See, just to mm -hmm. precise, the, 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 the building we did like was uh, certified by the engineer so it's yeah. like he's but it's safe structurally sound yeah. the engineer was involved in the design yeah we don't do like stuff you know like just to try we make sure like it's safe for people yeah that's know. very <laughs> responsible and that was based off the vertical columns in the building right yes yeah. so going forward is that what we'll have to continue relying on is these poured vertical columns Probably. Yes, I know, depending on, you know, like there's this geopolymer mix that's coming out. I'm sure we are at the beginning of it. So maybe in 10 years, we're going to have the same interview and we're going to now we have this material that is structural with the insulation and it's going to be magic, you know, in some way. Maybe not, but maybe it's probably where it's going to go. Like we're going to have some material that will be structural on their own. So, yeah, that would change a lot. Yeah, there, there's you know there's other ways of doing um, of doing it. Like one way is with post tensioning, for example, using diagonal rods that are tensioned to pull the building down against the footings. There's other ways to um, achieve structural integrity. Um, yeah, so it's just the the thing is that the easy way to do it is what we did, which is they're very familiar with that uh, pilaster column. 
type of design so that we just did it the easy way for now. Yeah, some teams have even experimented with attaching a hose with regular concrete to pour the columns instead of navigating the uh, concrete truck around your printer, depending on what your system schedule looks like. Uh, yeah. So all of your permitting or engineering work was done based off of traditional engineering instead of uh, they're not looking at the structural integrity of the printed wall necessarily, right? No, no, the, no. The guy basically the printed wall itself that is not part of the support. However, the the guy part of the design was that the printed wall has to not fall down, and because this, the structural support is what keeps the roof up, but then the wall itself has to have some integrity. And and the way we did the farm sand was we put those those fins like you notice every about every three feet there's a the wall sort of comes in at 90 degrees for about eight or eight inches or so and it goes back out again so it creates those um structural fins mm -hmm. and the other thing we did we put horizontal rebar about every foot uh, across the biggest span at the back so so there's and then and then in, in addition to that the the concrete was full of fibers so it, it has structural um integrity that way as well yeah it's uh really unfortunate that the engineer doesn't see it that way <laughs> well he actually you know he, he's actually was pretty pretty open like some 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 of them some of these guys are just extremely conservative and not willing to look at anything and the guy we have i think he's pretty good actually he's pretty you know he's He's pretty, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, he's he's, he's, he's happy with what yeah. we're doing. Like, you know, in all like things moving on, and he's, we have to be honest. Three D printing is the future of construction. No matter what you want to say, no matter what you think, it's a fact. It's cheaper, faster, and we're gonna go with easy printer to set up. That's gonna make the job like very very easy. So, wow, that's a lot of confidence. I haven't been, I haven't seen sufficient evidence to feel that confident that it's cheaper and faster yet. So it hasn't. Uh, made itself that obvious to me at this point but yeah. i haven't done it like you have making my own material uh operating the printer so uh have you done a you say cheaper faster is that based off your gut feeling is that the future i don't know as a buzz of the number we we run by doing uh, what we did can we get yeah, more it's, that? it's just based on uh if, if you look at the volume of concrete used you know to build the uh the the forms for the footings plus the interior and exterior walls plus the infill concrete for the footings and the rebar if you just add up all the numbers um you know based on a bead width that we're using about one and three quarter inch bead width um you know it just it just adds up to you know whatever eight thousand dollars or whatever for the material and then plus some labor and, and markups and overhead and stuff like that so you know, it just, it works out that we can do um, all the stuff I just described. Probably about, another 2,500 rotor stators as well. Well, with our system, we, mm -hmm. we, we've gone away from the rotor yeah. stator. We, we, we don't like it. It does not pump no. the low cost material. It just doesn't wow. work. That's amazing. You don't use and, a rotor stator? No, no, no we, we, we have the hopper. We, no, the hopper dispenses by using an auger, mm -hmm. okay, out of the nozzle. The, the question is, how do you fill the hopper? And there's many different ways to fill the hopper. We can use a piston pump because it doesn't have to be a continuous flow. You can use a diaphragm pump. You can use peristaltic. Uh, we, you could use a rotor stator maybe with a different yeah, material. Yeah, you can use a conveyor too. Depending you, on how you, you can use, and you, but what we were doing, we were just doing it using buckets by hand because we're- Yeah, I think we, some of the cost effectiveness you're realizing at this point is from the hand mixing, which doesn't, really uh, realize the benefits of automation because hand mixing isn't no. uh, really something people do these days. So well, no, but we don't intend it to stay that way. That's just with us yeah. where we, we haven't decided yet which type of system we're going to use to fill the hopper. We know a rotor pump is not what we want. I like that a lot. If you can avoid yeah. a rotor stator, if you can delete that part, that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's, there, that's, that's completely insane. Like there, we've drawn, we're talking about having a machine and can push Many type of material, not just concrete. 
cob, with yeah. straw, with like, you know, and this water thing is like, is, is great for some type of material. Lata Crete is going very well through that, no issue. The rest, forget it. It's, it's not, it's not meant for that. Yeah. Well, and, and also you can't stop really. You have to just keep going all the time with, with our system. You can stop yeah. and anytime yeah. you want to, once you do the perimeter of the building, the 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 uh, the the hopper moves over to the side and comes down, ready to be refilled. Right, so every single transit is like a separate little yeah. journey, you know. And you can stop any time after a full transit. And talking about fact, like we use about three hundred bags of concrete, and we waste one and a half bag. That's it. Yeah, I had this conversation recently. Concrete can be you can have little waste. And even on our traditional construction site, if you plan really well, you can have very little waste, but most people don't put the extra thought and effort into planning. So right now as founders, you guys are super invested. It's that it's taking a lot of your time and attention uh, in a way that your hundredth project, you won't be dedicating that same level of attention to. It'll be like muscle memory. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not that, right? Because like the system with the rotor stator, if you have an issue, you're going to waste what you got in the, in the holes. You're going to waste what you got in the pump. When we got an issue, we don't waste anything. Mostly, mm -hmm. we just put it back in the hopper and we keep going. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. Like, in fact, this system in terms of waste is way better. Like, no issue. I use both. And I can tell you, I add the pump, the M tank pump. If I can burn it, I would probably burn it. In, in fact, if you know somebody <laughs> that wants an M tank pump, we have, we have one. For we can sale. get it. Like, <laughs> fine. And this is good for some use, but not for 3D printing concrete. That's no so, way. you don't like, you got the M tank pump, you're ready to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, well, to modify it, but like it's not meant for it's meant for that activity working very well. Like you can have a good flow, it's, it's going through very well. For the rest, Lafarge and also Mitchikri, just forget it. You just so waste you your need time. Some and... solution, uh, yeah. for the mixer pump. The pump solution, I think we were talking about like a piston pump. Well, 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 see, the thing is, if if you're using an auger in a hopper, you it doesn't matter how you fill the hopper. It doesn't have to be filled On the continuously. Yeah. It can be filled using um, a pulsing system like a piston pump or a diaphragm pump, right? The thing about rotor stator that's so nice is you get a continuous flow, which is really great for coming out of the nozzle. But if all you're doing is filling the hopper, there's no benefit to it at all. I mean, there's, it's, you know, you can use other types of pumps and um, and we're 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 not sure yet which type we're going to go to, but we're definitely going to automate the whole thing. We do not want to be dumping buckets by no. hand. That's just what we did for the previous project. But the next phase of investment in equipment will be a, a way to fill the hopper automatically. Yeah, it's great that when you're getting started, hand mixing is an option that's so viable in terms yeah. of gaining confidence with material, gaining confidence operating the printer with the software. Uh, you can check a lot of boxes and decrease a lot of risk factors yep. before yeah, you jump into the next. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what's your next steps? Do you need to fundraise to go to the next level or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we need fundraise. Yeah. yeah. So, so the next, the next phase is to, is to do a little bit of fundraising in order to get the, the system we have more automated. But then the next phase beyond that is to go to this next generation printer which which we're calling the producer, which can set it could be operating within an hour of arrival at a site, and it can print a 900 square foot house. And um, we another thing about that is what we 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 really think it's important to be to be partnered with a construction company because they already have the license for being you know for building houses. They already have the marketing. They they already have gone through a lot of the um, the hurdles, you know, for for being able to to do that. And if we're a partner with them, and all we do is provide the three D printing, that's an ideal relationship. So that's kind of what we're what we're looking for. Yeah, I really appreciate the mentality you guys have when it comes to being early adopters with the system and uh, improving things yourself, not just accepting the parts, the mixer pumps, the uh, materials that are presented to you, but developing them yourself, because that's what the industry needs to improve and reach the promises of faster, cheaper, better. Uh, people think that they can just top in and press a button. And <laughs> yeah, 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 I agree. 
I really, really like the, the experience we got. I mean, you can buy a printer, you can do things, but the guy that will make the difference is the guy that doing the job because you learn so much and you have to adapt. You 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 work with the live create. I don't know what you call it, but it's a live material. Depending on the during the day, it would change. You have to change the recipe. So you need to have this sensitivity of how everything goes and how to prevent to think and to feel ahead what's going to happen. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Is that similar to other R and D examples from the past? Um, well, <laughs> oh man, for me, well, not really because the stuff I did was all much more to do with lighting and and trying to, um, you know, like for example, cutting cutting fibers. You know, like you you'd cut twenty fibers and eighteen of them would be perfect, and and two of them wouldn't be, and we you could never we never actually figured out why the two were <laughs> they weren't good so i suppose this i don't know this is a little bit like that i mean chemi you're dealing with a lot of factors here the chemistry the humidity temperature and yeah yeah, yeah. So, how long it's been mixed for like if you mix it for too long what happens is it looks really nice but it actually doesn't cure properly because it's already partly cured and we had a some failures from that happening and we have a lot yeah, of like yeah. we have to be honest we went through a lot of failure that's great because we saw many things and we had to do lots of troubleshooting already but like yeah it's uh it's a, it's, it's very challenging very challenging i did some wasn't i work in special effect before i work with machine and stuff like that that was new I have to be improved and but this is the most challenging thing i ever did in my life in terms of work there's a lot more variables than most things. Uh, it's not just electricity. It's a construction site. You have materials, hardware, software, uh, robotics, heavy equipment, uh, all kinds of stuff. The mixer pump systems, like its own innovation, and then the printer. Uh, it's just a lot of stuff going on. The digital modeling. Uh, yeah. To have so many things coming together, and it's a big for effort all? for sure. For now, we are two. Like on the site, we print. We, will, we are two, and you see other 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 people. They have like a crew of six people, seven people, and you can see, you know, we just two guys. And actually, yeah. we, we did it. So it's like, well, yeah, it's it's a lot of things to think and to do in the same time. Yeah, people are capable of different things when they're starting their own business. Uh, than somebody who maybe an employee doesn't have the same kind of uh, dedication. And yeah. then it requires four at that point. And then the yeah, six after that, who knows? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's hard to get people to be as dedicated as the initial founders, I guess. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a big, like, we can go deep in this conversation. But yeah, like, <laughs> if you work for yourself, you're going to be way more, like, pay attention of everything. Because at the end, you're the one going to get the reward or the crap. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and... I mean, it's a big effort still for two people. Uh, have you had any kind of like safety issues, like printers moving somewhere you're not looking? Or The thing I will say in terms of safety, this is a very safe environment because the machine is doing its path. Uh, if you're careful about that, you cannot be scratched by the machine because it's open everywhere. Uh, there is some issue you can bump your head when you maybe click too close because the wire access is just about we and you forget it. But otherwise, I don't think there is any issue. Concrete could be like toxic or be dangerous that way, but we can manage that. So I don't see anything like very safe. For yeah, this. yeah. I mean, it's it's like any construction site. I mean, you know, you're going up a going up a ladder to um, yeah. to to bolt on the Y to mm -hmm. bolt the X axis to the uh, the tower. For example, you're up a ladder. You know, so that that's not super safe but it's probably no more dangerous than any typical construction site. So were you anticipating the R&D effort before you purchased the printer or were you expecting to buy a product like an HP printer? No, no, I, I, uh, I made an assumption that the people developing the mix, the various people developing mixes would have made so much progress by the time the printer actually got delivered, uh -huh. that we would just pick and choose a mix. And um, there's a company in Winnipeg called Multicrete who 
told me that they thought they could make a, a 3D printing mix for 30 cents a kilo, 30 cents Canadian a kilo. And uh, I contacted them about a month ago and I said, so what's it gonna cost? And they said $1.15. So it's like, you know, that's so that's sort of why we ended up having to do our own mix. And, and mm. I did, did not plan on doing that, that's for sure. Yeah. So when you start fundraising, what will the will you do crowdfunding or will you do like equity venture capital? Uh, what's your strategy? I don't know exactly what we're going to do for now. We, we haven't we haven't looked. We have not gone down the path of crowdfunding. It's a really interesting question. I it's mean, maybe point, maybe yeah. that's what we should do. Yeah. Right now, we're just raising money through um, friends and family, uh, you know, just just. Regular. Ourself, we finance ourselves a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the, but like I said, like like to do to get the machine evolved uh, further down the path that's already on, we, yeah, we'll just do it that way. But the bigger, the bigger, more exciting thing is is to develop this next machine called the producer, and that's going to be quite a bit more money because it's a, we're talking about a, a brand new big machine. So that that would be. What we want to what we hopefully want to do is be partnered with a construction company that would that would then finance that development, or by being partnered with them, it would be much easier to raise money because you know we're stronger with them than we are without them, right? Would you have the guys at Twenty build that producer machine for you? Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, it's probably a possibility. Yeah, and would it be different from their Berlin printer? The, Yes. The, well, the Berlin is just a gantry with a robot arm on the hanging down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it'll be very different from that. It is still a gantry system, but it'll be deployed out of a from a. Yeah, we're talking uh, about something that would be like mobile, yeah. easy, and could be set up everywhere almost, but very easy to set up, not like we have. So. Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, the machine we have is designed to go into a backyard, so you can take the whole machine through a gate. Sure. And set it up in a backyard. The, the producer is not like that. The producer will be a large vehicle uh, where the machine kind of deploys out of the vehicle. So it, it's you, it has to be a relatively flat site, and you you know you can't be using it in a backyard. You know it's it's not. So the, the Intrepid would carry on for backyards, and then the producer would be used more for housing developments and you know easy access areas. Will you operate in Canada exclusively, or uh, what's the plan? Yeah, there's a big market already, so yeah. I think we can be busy for the next decades with Canada. But no, we're not yeah. stuck somewhere else. I, I... Yeah, the intention is is to, well, you know, Icon in in Texas, right? There's nothing like that in Canada. The intention is for somebody who wants to become Canada's leader can can do it. Um, we're, we're we're open to going to the U.S. if nothing happens in Canada, but it's the, the intention is to try to do it. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a strong housing market in Canada, so I think there's a need for uh, it there as much as there is here. Yeah, yeah. It's it's why like drivers like for me, it's what drive me. Like it's like we have a crisis of housing. If with this technology, we can do something for for that, make it accessible, faster, cheaper. Yeah, of course, of course will you be hiring soon have you hired it's just you two now yeah well yeah. we need to get some uh, funding i would say first and from that we can hire people yeah 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 we're looking um at yeah there's we, there's a need for um cad or, or you know emmanuel has been doing the cad but we need to you know he needs to get more training uh to work with the the machine uh the computer has to be able to control the we need to have good software, but the There's, CAD, everything yeah. has to talk together too, because now you do the CAD, you bring that on a USB stick, you convert it and you're going to the machine. So everything has to be integrated. You need to be able to modify your design as you print. If like you on want, the fly. On yeah. the fly. So there's a need to upgrade uh, the CAD as well as the machine, how it controls the, how the computer controls the machine. Because right now, yeah. The machine, the computer does not talk to the auger. The auger, Emmanuel is continuously adjusting it 
Yes, yeah, all by like I, I also I adjust the G code sometime on the on the fly. That's that's a lot. Like so, if you want to be like reasonable about it and to be like professional, I would say is to have different people to do different things and to make everything work, talk together and work together. Yeah, I mean, especially if somebody hasn't built the whole system uh, from the ground up and did on all the trial and error testing, it's hard to focus on two different moving parts at once. Uh, even following this technology, making videos about it online, I did an operator test in the Netherlands and yeah, it was, I was forgetting everything. <laughs> I made so many mistakes. Because <laughs> you have uh, stress, huh? When the thing is flowing out, you say, I cannot stop the flow, so I have to do something. It's not yeah. like a plastic printer where you can stop and restart. Concrete printer is not like you can't. You have to go with the thing, so you have to be there. Yeah, and things so require a lot more attention as a beginner, uh, too. So, the uh, yeah, even though you guys are able to do it as two people, I think it might still take like four. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you how do you decide which things are the most important for you to focus on when there's so many different challenges, like the software, the design? Let's so say it's very simple. It's a million What's dollars more, where sorry. do you allocate the money yeah what is more important is if you want to do a good job you need to have a good tool and so what have to be improved is the tool so the printer have to be improved and the software to run the printer and to do the CAD have to be improved that's the priority for the most part the printers seem pretty good to me in terms of uh they go where you tell them to and yeah. uh they're, they don't need to be much faster. Uh, most of the improvements need to come from the material, the mixer pump system. Yeah. Yep. 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 No, that, no, that's exactly right. We, our, our focus will be on the, how, how to get the, the dry material mixed and then how to get it into the hopper. I mean, that's how to automate right, that. That's what I call a printer. And, Sorry. Yeah. And, and then the, and then like we were talking earlier, the software, we, as, as the, as the nozzle approaches a corner, and so we want it to slow down and then speed up again coming out of the so corner. You can do it we, by G code, but you want to do it like more yeah. automatically. Yeah, we and so the, the computer has to tell the auger to slow down, not just the nozzle, but the auger itself has to slow down at the same time, right? So there's a just you know communication um yeah. heart, what do you call it? I think like we already know what we have to do and we must know how to do it. Now the question is the money is what it is for now. So yeah, yeah it's where we are. But by yeah, the way, just a little story things. about um, a, a little story about Emmanuel's um, how how good he is at being a print master. <laughs> we had a situation where the the bead there is about another two feet of bead to to do to finish the perimeter, and something went wrong. I, I don't remember what it was. Something went wrong with the software, and, and the thing stopped. So he he took a piece of tube about a foot long, and he put the mix in, and then he's he's holding the tube and he's tapping it with a pair of pliers, and and he's being like a human 3D printer just to finish the last two feet. It was pretty uh, resourceful, like I, said, I thought. You have to be like, in you have to be sharp in trouble. That's the special effects career coming into play. Yeah, yeah the yeah. guy worked with million dollar machine and if something happened, they want it fixed in the next hour, hour or the beyond, you know, like before it's broken. So you develop something, it's like, oh, I see something. Why can I, and you grab everything you have around you to fix it. And is what happened. And is we have some other example like that where suddenly something happened you, you didn't expect it at all, and the the dismantle is alive. Like it's like you cannot. You have to dry. You have cold runs. You cannot wait. You cannot like spend an hour or two to think of what you have to do. It has to be in the next five minutes. So yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. So with a million dollars, where do you allocate the million dollars? Which is for startups, you're probably trying to raise a lot more than that. But I'm saying if you, let's say you didn't yeah. raise as much as you were anticipating and you had to pick and choose where to invest, uh, where do you put the million? Well, the first the first the first hundred thousand would go towards improving the automation of, of the current system, right? Like loading the hopper, mixing the material. Software. That and the software upgrades that'd be a hundred thousand maybe 150 at the most which software but the slicer software both like i said like we would like to have something that when you like in a plastic printer you bring your CAD into the slicer and it's doing it's giving the direction to the machine we want something we can really like walk like 
dynamics. I mean, like if you see something wrong on your print, you want to readjust the next layer and you want to do it right away. That's, that's the ultimate thing we would like to have. Once you get into creating software for 3D modeling, it becomes complex matrix math and the pool of people who are capable of coding at that level becomes very small and expensive. You know, it's a, like, it's a big, it's a big market. Like we have, to, like I say, for me, I do believe that's the future of construction. And even if it's not, even if it's like 5% of the market of construction, it's, we're talking about billion. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, we're not talking about that going down to the fundamental level of no. the, that of the CAD. We're talking about just taking a CAD model and converting it to G code mm -hmm. and, and having the, the machine fully controlled by the computer instead of partially controlled. But, yeah, but with the nuances of like your, the auger speed, your mixer yeah, system, yeah. however you decide. Already everything is already existing. It's not like you just have to be put together and work together. But to, to finish your, your previous question about if we had a million dollars. Yeah, you have 800,000 um, left after investing the first 100,000 in the right. uh, automation and the second 100,000 in. For, for that, for 800,000, that's more than enough to build the producer, to design it and build it. That's more than enough. Yeah. And that machine, I don't think there's anybody out there who has a machine like that. I, I know the, I, we saw a video from the army. They have something like that, but I don't know if they're even using it. So I know it was a prototype I don't yeah. know on, on CAT. So I don't even know if someone built something like that, but it's, I mean, if you really want to solve the crisis in the world, like you need to have something that's quick, mobile, easy to use. So this is, and we can do it. Like, no, we have the technology to do that. It's not like we're talking mm -hmm. about something like in science fiction. It's, it's completely there. We can do it. Yeah, and, and that's and and also that reminds me, like the improvements to the Intrepid would inc include things like built-in laser leveling already built in. Because mm -hmm. right now we just take a, a conventional <laughs> spinning a mirror thing and we adjust each yeah. leg, you know, like by hand right it's, so working, everything, it's, it's working well but just you take like an hour to do it just takes yeah we have it takes about a day to get it fully set up with two and people with two people yeah, yeah we want to we want to get that down to half a day so it's like it's the timing that you like two people you can do it like in a day you print in two or three days and you take it down in one day so you can just really like build a tiny kind of small house in a week what kind of equipment do you need for the printer you're using now a forklift or you lift everything by hand it's all made to John is brilliant. Like he got this design. I was like, wow, everything can be moved by two guys. Cool. No, but he's talking about, no, but the forklift for loading it. Okay. So the, no, we don't need a forklift for moving it around. It's all or assembling the printer. Around. But, but what, what is needed is for loading the, the mix, right? Cause the dry mix, you can buy it in bags, like 25 kilo bags, or you can buy it in these, you know, 1300 kilo yeah. super sacks. And the thing about the super sacks, is that the the cost of the the super sack has gone up and up that that it's not any cheaper or we've been told anyway by by target that it's not any cheaper it's, it's just the same price to get to get you know 56 bags yeah, as it is to get a super sack so but there's no, need, no so, need for yeah yeah so with a super sack you need to lift it with a forklift yeah, right but, but with the bags you can do it yeah. you can do it by hand so before we were talking about have something to lift up big bags but since the price is almost the same, we just do small bags. One seems to be more automated. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. It's better to have a the super sack and a forklift. And then you just you just control the valve on the bottom of it. We it's also thought to by instead to have like a, to lift up the bag is to have something that will vacuum the dry mix into the mixer. Because it's possible yeah. to, it's existing. So mm -hmm. we'll see. One thing you mentioned earlier that I haven't talked about in depth on the podcast because i don't know too much about it is peristaltic pumps yeah well we, we yeah well we we were very interested in that we we I did a little bit of research and it looks like a peristaltic pump is very likely the way to go for loading the hopper and and that's one of the, the, the very much that's one of the things we're going to look into is is using a peristaltic pump for that i i don't know if anybody actually doing it but mm -hmm. i mean it certainly is a very strong possibility for um for us someone emailed me maybe 18 months ago and said hey has anyone tried using a peristaltic pump with a printer uh and i told a couple people that make printers 
have you tried it? And I never really heard anything back about it. Uh, so you, you don't have one yet. That's no, it. no, but see, the thing is, I don't know if you can run the, the nozzle directly from a peristaltic pump because a, a mm. peristaltic pump pulses, right? Yeah. It, it puts the material out in pulses. And that may not work nicely with a nozzle, but for loading a hopper, it's fine because the hopper doesn't have to be loaded in a continuous manner. You know, you can just load it in pulses and it, it makes no difference because the auger's putting out the bottom part on the laying down the bead in a continuous manner. So it doesn't matter how the top is being filled. Yeah, what about the pressure in the peristaltic pump? Would it be able to, or the peristaltic hose, would it be able to maintain like 40 PSI? Well, it, it doesn't even, we don't need it that. doesn't matter because it's, it's not, it, the, it, it's not, it's just loading the hopper, yeah. right? There's not this, Concrete and you can really use heavy. a relatively large hose. It's a good thing with this system. Like you don't need to have pressure in the, in the hose. You just need to have like material going in enough yeah. to, to follow the speed of the printer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the the the, peop the people that make the peristaltic pump, I I can't remember the name of it right now. I I have the website, um, I just can't remember the name. But they um, claim that it it will do what we need it to do. I mean, it'll pump the distance and the height that we need. If you can eliminate the need for a new rotor stator all the time, uh, that would be really powerful. I don't think I've seen any any site that's done that yet. That's the thing, right? Like, because the, the mix we use is full of sand and it's not like with plasticized on it. So, like, going through rotor stator, enough, you're probably going to run like half the print and you have to change because it's going to destroy the, the system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like, there's no way it's going to go like uh, for, for a long time. So, you know, yeah. The, the other thing that, that, that I'm, that we're both really interested in is a piston pump that's a small flow piston pump. The, the ones that are out there seem to be able to pump about 17 cubic yards an hour. And we only need to pump about one cubic yard an hour. And yet I, I, I've done quite a bit of searching and I, I can't find anybody who makes a low, a low flow piston pump. So that's another thing that, that could do the job that we, that we need. One cubic yard per hour sounds kind of slow. Yeah, well, we're. I think if you, but we're only. That's about what we're we're, yeah, maybe we're printing. It's a, it's a bit maybe more, maybe two at the most. Two, but we don't need sixteen. Because if so you're how doing many about, hours did it take to do the ten by twenty building? Well, it's about fourteen hours yeah. of printing. I mean, the First reality bad. is the whole project took longer because of some issues, software problems, and stuff like that. But the, the when it was actually printing, yeah. we were printing at about 0.6 of a foot vertically per hour. We could easily print at about one foot per hour vertical. And if you look at the spec on the Lafarge material and that, they, they talk about half a meter per hour vertical printing. So, you know, from that, you can just, you can calculate the bead width and the, and you could, you can get the volume you're putting out. And it's, it's, it's pretty low, you know, compared to a normal concrete pump. Do you know how many yards that building used? I, I do, I don't have the number in my in my head, but it, it used 300 bags, 325 kilo bags. Okay. And and the bag yields about 0.55 liters per kilo. So you can you can do the math, like 25 times 300 times 0.55 is the amount of liters it, it would have used. Okay. Um, and printing a foot a day it doesn't always no, come out to a foot, a foot per hour foot per hour yeah so what was the maximum height you would print in one day uh 24 well inches. well the the truth is we we could have we were having if, yeah. if we weren't having we had almost every day there was a problem yeah. with something like like the mixer we ended up destroying two mixers uh, just because one of those really old and the other one was a somebody else's oh, and, else. and then we bought a brand new one. It's been really good since then. Yeah. Uh, we had software problems. We had um, like the motor the, to the, push the material was we, we, some issue. Like it's... But when it was working well, like we were doing, you know, 
0.6 of a foot per hour. And we we could have just kept yeah, going. And we good. we just chose to not push our luck, you know. So we, we never printed more than about two feet in a day. Yeah. We could have. Yeah. And we intend to and like I said, like you like if I like you said, like you like we just two people, you need more people. If you want more people, you don't have to focus so much on everything, so you're not so tired doing things. Yeah, so the house print, uh, what's the ETA on that and uh, what will come afterwards? Well, well, we to, to basically, we haven't even tried to find anybody yet to, who wants to do a house. Maybe we, someone listening now. But we can... Yeah. We, we can we can we can put we we're we, we can quite easily find somebody who'll want to do it the the main thing is we don't really want to do it with the same setup that we did the farm stand with we want to have this loading of the hopper more automated because it's very physically difficult on, to what we did i mean my body <laughs> my body still hasn't recovered from what we did two months ago um so you know, we, we want to get our equipment upgraded before we get to our the house. Definitely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in the meantime, is there uh, other R&D efforts you're working on for the startup besides fundraising? So like internal efforts? Well, the design work, yeah, like the, the design work that would happen when, when we have the money, for example, sourcing a, a more powerful motor for the auger the motor we have is a 54 RPM motor and it works very nicely, but the problem is when you slow it down, it, it doesn't have enough torque. So we need a, a, a motor that has that keeps the torque as it slows down. We also want it to go faster than 54 RPM. We want it to go about hundred RPM and, and maintain its torque at lower speed. So, um, and, and also we want it to be controlled by the computer so there's, you know, so I'm doing the sourcing work, you know, re, you know, phoning suppliers and looking at what's out there. There's also the the question of loading the hopper. Are we going to use peristaltic? Are we going to use um, conveyor? Are we going to use are we going to use diaphragm? Are we going to use piston? You know, the, the these the design work that associated with those questions can be done. Now we can proceed with the the labor part of it without uh, too much extra money and so and then once we have the money then we can buy the part need. yeah cool so what's the printer doing now is it waiting we print some uh tilt up uh, fence panel yeah yeah so we, we yeah we, we on the video it shows um the fence panels that we we printed and uh yeah, so so basically we're 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 sort of waiting, but it, but at the same time we're not. We made that video, the the eleven minute video. We we made that. We we're doing this one now. You know, there's things that are being done that this, are, yeah. and I've been, um, you know, we're we're putting articles on the local uh, media site for this island. Um, um, also, all the calculation we do for the next project, and able to quickly like be on site. We have people that need to move on, need to plan. So now we're planning, we're calculating what we have to, what's going to be. We, so like we're never going to stop because it's our nature to always keep moving on and improving and make things better. So yeah, yeah. yeah so the two the two main activities right now um, are the attempt you know the fundraising basically just promotion of of what we're doing to find the right investors and the other one is the design work you know the design work for the better pump system and and we're looking at using electric winches to raise the x beams rather than hand winches and you know there's a lot of stuff like that that's design oriented and sourcing sourcing work you know that we're doing. right before i lost you you were mentioning articles Oh well, yeah. There, like for example, right now um, we we're we're basically promoting the us. <laughs> we're promoting ourselves to the world, I guess. Local and newspapers lo or lo local local uh, publications, and then uh, the the video, um, and then you know the, what you're doing, and and we're looking, um, you know, at construction companies, ideally locally, want local ones that want to yeah. become 
the leaders in 3D printing. And but if they don't have to be local, it could be anywhere. I mean, seriously, it could be anyone in the states for that matter. Yeah. We're, we're kind of hoping to keep it in Canada, be, but it doesn't be, have to be. Could be Icon that contacting us say they want to take the Canadian market. That would be it. You know? So if you know of any construction companies that are looking at you know becoming leaders in 3D printing, we're we're very interested in uh, in talking to them. Yeah. What's the best way for them to reach you? Well, well, through the website, the uh, strongprint3d.com. And on the website, there's a contact page uh, with email. Uh, my, my email is john at strongprint3d.com. And Emmanuel is Emmanuel at strongprint3d.com. My, my name is spelled J-O-N. There's no H in it. Cool. And so people should reach out if they want to work for you, if they want to invest, if they're construction companies, uh, maybe if they have a peristaltic pump. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Or, or, or if they have a, a low flow piston pump, pump, that would be good too. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we kind of like the idea of a piston pump because it's just, it's been so proven, you know, in, mm. in the world already, right? Where, what other use cases uh, are there for piston pumps? Well, well, they're used all the all the concrete pumping that's being done, other than mortar. I mean, all the big, all the um, the, truck, the, yeah. the, the what's being used for buildings. You know, those big pumper trucks that have the arm that reaches out, you know, a hundred feet or whatever. Those those things are all using piston pumps, and they use uh, two pistons that mm -hmm. go sort of like back and forth. You know, they they alternate, and so if you look at what comes out of them at the end, it's it comes out in pulses. You know, it doesn't come out continuous. Yeah, I don't know why I always thought those were gravity fed. Well, they are gravity fed. The the pump itself is gravity fed because there's a hopper above the pump, but then the but then the pump is is pushing you know into the into the articulated uh, arm at a controlled rate. Yeah. Yep. You definitely need a lot of control when you're pumping the printed concrete versus just pouring into a form. Well, but, fact, no, yes, no, but obviously, same. We have like this hopper that will mm -hmm. like give the, you some uh, extra. Yeah, you have like, you have this amount of concrete to be able to whatever happen. So it's not like it's like when you have a flow like the M Tech pump that give you a continual flow. If you have any issue, is where it's an issue because you don't see it. You see it at the end of the nozzle, and the issue could be done like three minutes late, uh, before because you need, need three minutes to go to travel through. We don't have this system anymore. So we, we need to just have material going up fast enough to just keep going with the, the, the speed of the printer, but no more than that. When you were working in special effects, was that at your own company or were you working for another? No, no, no I work in France and it was for like a big, um, big place that doing lots of like uh, stages and everything for a theater and cinema. And so, yeah. Is this your first venture as a founder or co-founder? Uh, I had my own company in electricity when I was in France, but it was in construction. But it wasn't the same thing. Like this is very R&D development, something new technology. Like it's not like something like I did some stuff, but it was like for 50 or 60 years already there. This is new. This is completely new. This is a, and like an unknown, unknown world that you have to explore. And that's way more interesting, way more challenging, but it's, it's good. Like, it's great. Like, to make the world better with this technology, it's just amazing just to think of it. Yeah, when you were working construction, was it renovation work or was it... Uh... No, I do lots of, like, uh, I did lots of, like, uh, factory upgrade or some construction a little bit. Um, but, like, machine, everything is way more challenging and way more interesting to work with than just regular construction. Sure. What kind of machines? It could be like a machine to produce paper. It could be a machine to oh. produce food, some type of wood. It could be a machine to do plastic, whatever. It's uh, industrial things. Yeah, nice. I guess that was a lot more following instructions and a lot less figuring out the best practices. Yeah. The, the, mm -hmm. the special effects, you have people come, you have someone, an engineer come, okay, the director want to have this thing doing that because now let's let's think of it so it's way more that's creative totally creativity yeah that and that's the best job i did 
uh, in terms of creativity is like it was cool. very dumb. now I love what I'm doing but before that that was the best job I did like you have to be sharp you have to be like in like know what's going what's on the market you have to associate things together like what you got to put that together to make it work and of course they always ask for some kind of impossible things to do so it's amazing like it's just like challenging and you do it and at the end it's working and it's great that being said which one of those roles was more useful the experience for your current position the the graphic or the uh special effects or the machine construction and work tell me what's the which which of the two jobs you described the machine work versus the special effects work was more helpful for your current role oh special effects because wow. like for the machine is like uh, i don't have to do much here like it's already like wire and everything yeah that's very unintuitive but, so in terms of the, the the spirit of troubleshooting that's very important to be able to see the to assess the situation and it's okay i got that around me and i have to fix it make it happen so how did you guys team up and uh where did you guys meet uh, we we met uh, that uh, when uh, that place i was building this greenhouse like for a friend of john like this geothermal greenhouse so we we met oh, yes month. yes yeah. and so from there how long after that did you decide to start a company together? Uh, was well, after well, I had already I had already started the the design and and ordering of stuff already working with Twente. Yeah. Um. So it had already, it already was in existence, and Emmanuel um started working you know helping me build things and and finish the building the machine, and then and then um. We, he, you know, after a little while, he, he became, a, he started to invest in the company and, and became uh, more of a partner than an employee. So it was kind of through attrition. Um, it wasn't, uh, you guys didn't just come together and say, hey, we're starting this company. Uh, I guess it was, uh, it wasn't written out in stone from the beginning. No, no. Yeah, so that whole thing I described, it, it probably took place over about a year. Yeah, because it was about yeah. June. Well, we went up to uh, twenty in May of last of May of twenty twenty one, and uh, and then the machine arrived here on June of twenty twenty one, and now it's just uh, well, now we're into August of twenty twenty two. So it's been about a year. Yeah, they say in. Uh that the first follower is the most important. So if Emmanuel was your first follower for strong print, then now you guys are a team and you got a, a more momentum going and uh, you're getting some prints. Uh, yeah, it's a cool thing to see. And how long ago was it that you got the printer delivered? About Ju yeah, June of 2021. More than a year ago. Yeah, barely a year. Um, and so the from delivery to your first print, like when did you finish the house or the, sorry, the farm stand? Um, well, it was, uh, we did like some like recently. Well, the, yeah. well, the farm stand was just done about two months ago. So yeah. that would have been uh, June of 2022. Yeah. But there is, there's, there is a period of time where we were doing a lot of experiments with different materials and uh, upgrading the machine. It took yeah. us a while to figure out that we did not want to use a, a rotor stator. And then we started going to the hopper system and just the hopper system was quite a bit of development in itself. There's a lot of little secrets. We, we also had out. Like a moment where there was like about three months where we had some software issue that no one was yeah. able to fix. Yeah. And that put us like, uh, like, in a, like the moment where there was like, the, it's outside. So the, we have, we depend on the weather. So the thing get bad. So we have about three months or four months or we didn't do much because you were stuck with that situation yeah we were yeah, working in um in very cold weather it was even barely above freezing on some of yeah. the days trying different materials and yeah. stuff like that so there yeah so we had a software major software problem that pretty much shut the whole thing down for about two months and then there was this cold weather and then you know yeah yeah so like we went through like many things like it was very very challenging in, like physically to mentally and physically but we went through, so. Do you have any <laughs> estimate how many rotor stators you went through before you decided to do away with them? 
I think we went to one or two maximum. We, we, yeah, we only yeah we only went through about two of them. But the nice thing is, quick. it wasn't so much that they're wearing out. It was that wasn't the problem. The bigger well, for, they're extremely irritating to work with to yeah. clean them and and they they can get super hot and but anyway that's that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the low cost material that we wanted to use does not work with them. It just doesn't pump. It, it the the people that have developed the material at Lafarge or Latacrete or Sika or Baumet or whoever makes the 3D printed material, have, they must have plasticizers or other additives like whatever silica fume. I don't know what they put in there, but, but they put stuff in to make yeah, it yeah. work with a rotor stator. And we were using this um, low cost material that has very little in it. And it just didn't didn't work with a rotor stator, so that's why we had to get away from it. So you've went through the trials and tribulations, uh, getting the kind of learning curve of the system, and it seems that took like maybe eight to ten months. Um, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sure there's still learning stuff, but you're past the initial part of the learning curve. So do you well, think yeah. that's the same that other teams should expect when they buy a printer it's going to take uh eight months or so to really uh um i think it's depends on individual of and money also like how money how much money you got how your nature like and if i will recommend people to set up indoor first to make their to work indoor because like we on some way we went through the the worst in 3d printing like we have a new machine that nobody we worked with that before in outside and uh, we have some weather condition and so you have to get kind of, to adapt on so much different uh, level the, yeah i mean the main the main thing that that caused the the the, the we sort of the that caused us to have to do a lot of work was the desire to use a low cost material if we if we said fine we'll just use the expensive material everything yeah, we would have there would have been no problem i mean we'd be we'd to be using the Laticrete, which is what Twente mostly uses. And, um, and it'd be no problem, you know, but it's just that you can't justify doing work with that material, like from an economical point of view, it just doesn't make any sense economically. So it, it makes sense if you want to target people that they have money and they want some fancy things. And this is not where we stand. It could be a market. I'm not saying we don't want to do it, but what we want is to solve the crisis of housing now we are and they, we're talking about people who have some issue and they impact their life and they cannot afford to put three times the price of for the mix that so it's why john had this yeah it was right like I, he put us in the situation like we have to be like challenge ourselves and something else but it, it was right like we need to have something that's cheap yeah at the end of the day cost competitiveness is the most important thing yeah, for people, like, it's, it's important, you know, so. On, on that topic, there's a really, really, really interesting thing going on, which is uh, the use of geopolymer. Um, we, we, there's a guy in um, Las Vegas called William Hoff with Geopolymer International, who's been developing a geopolymer for use with 3D printers. In fact, in fact, a lot of the, uh, the, the material from Apiscore, he now has the material um and um he he says that if if you can source the material in north america and produce it in in high volume that it can be made for about the same price as portland cement mm. and it's a much much better material it doesn't shrink it's a form of glass basically it doesn't shrink it lasts five thousand years and concrete lasts 50 to 100 if you're lucky and it's um, it's yeah it's, and it's um, it, yeah and it's and it can be done for the same and oh no the main thing is from an energy point of view it uses very low energy it only has to be processed at 120 Celsius and no water and 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 whereas uh, Cortland cement said I don't know what I don't know what the temperature is but it uses very high temperature and it uses seven percent of the uh, power in the world is used to make Portland cement so. One the really cool, exciting thing is is if geopolymer can be produced at a decent price, that's that's where this really is going to be ma magic. 
And there's a company, there's a group of people in Edmonton, Canada, that are working with uh, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology to develop their own geopolymer. And I just had an email from the guy today, and, and it's like, that's, that's pretty cool. Because if that stuff can be made at a decent price, that's when this, this really is going to take off huge. Yeah, I visited William in uh, Las Vegas at their headquarters, saw their printer, and did a video with them. Uh, oh, yep. I didn't see their prints. They have a really unique mixer pump system, certainly. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they have a printer. Or that. No, no, he, he's always, no, he, he said one? he did. He said he did. Yeah, they have a big printer in their facility. Yeah. Oh, okay. The, 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 the geopolymer is quite difficult to work with um, because it's it's really strange. Like when you first... When you first mix it, it looks like a bunch of dry stuff, and then and then you spin it at high speed, and it becomes quite liquid. Um, the whole system, of, according to William Hoff, you have to do it in small batches. It's not a truly continuous process. It's like a whole series of small batches, one after the other, which is fine. Yeah, I mean he's he's developed a, a mixer pump system for, I think that's around. Sixty, seventy thousand dollars that that feeds his machine for for producing this stuff, and he's got something like a thousand recipes in it for different. Because apparently you can make geopolymer out of many different things, and I I don't know. I'm not a chemist, so I I can't say any more than that. But I'm just saying it's um it's something that we're pretty excited about uh, as a future possibility. Yeah, that's a good a good one, especially just in general. There's so many ways materials can improve uh and material science is developing so it's a nice place a beacon of hope for the industry to uh become much more competitive kind of overnight and i think you were saying about joe you can really like recycle lots of like byproduct so that's for me it's very important like if you can use what's garbage to make something i build tiny homes too before and i build my tiny home out of 75 80 percent of reuse or repurpose stuff and the result is quite good actually so why not doing that with printing yeah and another material that has some promises hemp creeps um we haven't we did a little bit of experimenting with it but but not very much no but there's you know there's promise there as well i mean it's like as you know you know there's the, the guys in italy and wasp are doing it with adobe yeah, a guy in Colorado too, uh, yeah. Real with emerging objects. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Your your recent video, of the yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, I like that solution so, a lot. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, to be able to grab the, the clay from the ground and to just like mix with whatever you got around fiber and produce something. The only issue you got is like you cannot do more than certain height every day because it has to dry. And maybe you should try to put a fire in the mid in the middle to dry faster. I don't know. It's be an idea. Took but, them six yeah. rotor stators as well. Oh, yeah, they go through a lot of rotor stators. Yeah, yeah so yeah, we yeah. thought he got. A, we were very excited because we thought he was using some kind of a new pump. And I went and saw like the. I said no. I know what you no thanks. <laughs> you know, there's there's all sorts of interesting things that can be done here with the mix. Like in fact. I, it seems to me there's an opportunity for somebody to make a mix that has the accelerator in in like in capsules, you know, like sort of time release capsules sort of idea so that you could print the stuff like the stuff could be sitting there in a mixer for days and not or not days, but, you know, hours and hours. And then but then when you print it somehow, then you somehow trigger the little the, the accelerator to release, you know, using microwave or whatever, I, some kind of way of making How do you know how much to trigger though? Because different days, different temperatures, you need different yeah. amounts, like you're saying. Yeah, no, but I'm just saying, uh, I, I'm just saying there's there's all sorts of opportunities here for um, for the people that develop yeah. mixes to come up with some cool I think John was saying like, for example, you print like a bit or uh, three, or three or four layer and you use something to kick up the, the accelerator yeah so that moment you'll be yeah. able to keep printing as fast as you want because you can control that by whatever uv or whatever it is yeah. i mean right now the equivalent is 2k right yeah. but, but 2k you know there's baumed and there's sika and they want you know two or three hundred thousand dollars for their nozzle and and so the, I, i'm sure somebody's going to come up with something Maybe that's that acts like that 
like I, I mean, the, the other example is that mighty buildings in Los Angeles with the ultraviolet light, right? That's another example where the mix is is not curing, and then all of a sudden you make it cure fast, right? After the nozzle, there's probably a way to do that with concrete that hasn't been done yet, or that's probably being done in a research lab somewhere. That so I that kind so. of thing is what's going to really help this this technology uh, get a foothold. Yeah. Is there something else that uh, the technology needs maybe that you would suggest young people to study if they want to get involved? Chemistry. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a major chemistry, chemistry issue, right? Also, like, could be an idea. We talk about that. We have, like, you know, the drone system to, to control the nozzle, for example. That would be interesting because at that moment, you don't need any equipment, just your drone and few oh. posts to, like, give, like, the, like uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That would be an idea to have this system in the future when you can carry like heavy load on, on a drone, for example. Yeah, Terran Robotics is doing that in uh, Indiana. I visited them a couple months ago. Right, that's a very good yeah. idea. We had that this idea like a year ago, yeah. but nobody in here know enough on drone to be able to Well, there, there is actually a drone company on our yeah, island called, called Indro, Indro Robotics, but they, they're just so busy with other stuff, they didn't want sure. to. Experiment. For me, I think it's amazing because you just like you don't need much. You just have this thing coming out, mixing. You grab the mix, come back, grab more mix, and like an insect or whatever. You know? Yeah, it's a lot less equipment. It yeah. needs to maintain staying airborne with a load. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know too much about drones, but it's fascinating. All the different automation solutions. Uh, I think the ultimate result may look totally different from what we what we've seen someone will invent something innovate something maybe it'll be your team comes up with a solution to realize uh how to build like 2k with cheaper material or something like that yeah i think there is a spirit like we talk with of some other people that they are the idea is to make the world better like many guys in that business want to improve what we got and they don't yeah. especially make huge money out of it they want to make life better. So that moment when you go with the spirit, many people will come together with ID, troubleshoot, whatever, like to make it work. So it's way more powerful than just want to make money out of that. But yeah, you know, definitely. I'm surprised there hasn't been some kind of open source printer plan uh, out there yet because the principle you're talking about, like a lot of people want to help make the world better uh, and participate in different ways. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. Uh, it, it's funny because Emmanuel was talking about possibly doing something like that, you know, open source printer design. Yeah. We, uh... But you know, the, the robotic part of it is is relatively straightforward. The, yeah. the chemistry part is the hard part. Actually, there's a guy doing like a uh, crazy Russian guy. He's doing some, I think he's one of these guys like doing like some big printer for plastic. You know, like the idea is not new. Like it's, we can, you can easily like make your own printer. Like I said, the experience you got of working with concrete, like no machine will replace that. No machine will be able to replace your experience. Well, I know some other skilled teams that are interested in the open source idea. So there'd be at least three groups that uh, would contribute to it if you guys want to start something like that. I, I don't know yeah. how to build it though. It's hard to build. So you're talking concrete. about the, the robotic part, not the chemistry part, right? Whichever part you want to uh, have it be on. Uh, I yeah. mean, GitHub or something is a great platform. I don't know if you guys make it. I'll I'll promote the links or whatever you want me to do. Yeah, sure. Like yeah. we can talk more about that because, yeah. like, if we can make this new this producer, like we this, this new printer, that will be a game changer for many people in this world. Like to have place to live properly and good, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, right now the the you know like a, like the Latacrete, Lafarge, and um, Sika and, and Multigreen and whoever is making 3D mixes, as far as I know, none of them are making a, a low cost mix. The only pr people I know that even talk about a low cost mix is Mudbots. And I don't know, they're very secretive about what they're doing. So I don't know what they actually have, but it's- Cobot and c -Mix about. talk about a low cost mix that requires a $200,000 batch plant mixer. Um, that would allow you to use large aggregate sizes. What aggregate size are you using in your mix? 
At four millimeter maximum. Nice. Oh. Because we don't have a, like if we change the motor for the auger, we're probably gonna be able to push bigger. Well, we could, yeah, we can push bigger, but the problem is the bigger the aggregate, the rougher it looks, yeah. right? But it's still, the, yeah, we can go bigger. What, if, you, if you plaster so then your print and if you don't want to keep the look of printing, you can push big aggregate, doesn't matter. Like, uh, Yeah, that's another uh, question. It doesn't matter so much, but do you prefer the layered look or the do you stuck over it? If you want something that looks good, like the lat lat acrylic was quality or multi acrylic also was very the the, the the result is amazing. It's smooth and it's like it's beautiful, but the price of it is also like very high too. So. Is there any uh, design philosophies you guys want to bring to the three D printed buildings that you create? Mm. For, I don't think, that, mm. yes, in the future, probably for now, we're more like in the practical way to, to make it like, uh, you know, like to get bigger and to make things. At the moment, we're going to be have this routine of having job and doing things. I'm sure we're going to be able to develop some specific. It's a good thing. With 3D printing, you can print, it's fast, but you can also print useful. For example, for a greenhouse, you could print a greenhouse with some system to have hot hair going through inside mm -hmm. the cell or inside the material you use. So this is the, the, the big uh, advantage of 3D printing. So it's not just beautiful, it's not just fast. It can be very useful. So I think we're going to go a lot more that way in the future. Yeah, we, we haven't focused too much on, uh, actually, on the, if you go on the website, you'll see there are definitely some designs, like in a, on the video, the, the 11 minute video, we show a, a house a curved, you know, curved houses that, that with two together that look like um, two setups create a house that looks like a Together. set of lungs that we call the deep cove house. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff like that, but we haven't we haven't put our focus on coming up with infinite amount of designs. We've been more focused on working with the material and you know that and getting the software working and yeah, fixing everything. Like we like uh, I think we are at the moment we went through the wood. We lost ourselves there. We found a video. We came, now we came out of the wood. Like we are, we fix lots of things. We know where we're going to go and how to go there. So it's where we are now. Yeah, I think you're allocating your effort appropriately from my third party perspective, but I, it's hard to tell. Yeah. yeah. There's so many different things that need work. It's like an endless, uh, I mean, it's yeah. innovation and every part needs to be innovated uh, probably forever. Yeah, but yeah. when you have something running, it's running. So you can make it better. That's that's where we are now. Yeah. In the meantime, are there smaller products that you can produce uh, and maybe profit generate some ROI for your company in the meantime? Well, yeah. Well, that's what like um, the latest effort has been on fence panels. Mm -hmm. And if you look and on the video, it shows um, it, a, a whole bunch of different designs of, of fence panels because it's, it's infinite amount of designs you can do. And um, so we, we, we came up with about 20 different designs for fence panels, but, you know, as far as actually finding a customer for fence panels, we would show them the ones we've designed, but they might want something different, right? So the, the whole idea is you can design a custom fence panel mm -hmm. for your house that nobody, and we, you could... <laughs> Like we could lock it yeah. so nobody else uses that design, right? You can have a, a unique look. So, yeah. So there's so smaller items like fence panels, and then those tilt-up letters like address signs. There is, and for, then that heart. You know, the heart for landscape. Um, like for for people that do landscaping, like you can go crazy with that. You can really like make some very fancy setup and beautiful things with concrete and this technology. Cool. Is there anything important or not important, doesn't matter, that we haven't covered yet? I don't think so. You know, you've been, this has been very thorough, actually. It's, it's really yeah, we amazing. Yeah, a lot of work. Yeah. I expect so much. Great. Well, thanks yeah. for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Cool. It's been yeah. a pleasure. You guys have been an open book, which I appreciate. Some people don't want to talk about some topics, but you've really been open and uh, it's been a great conversation. And I think maybe people who are looking into getting started can listen to your perspective and know what it's really like to uh, start operating a concrete printer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And they're welcome to 
ask question if you can answer them. <laughs> Do you have any plan to come up into this part of the world in Vancouver area soon? Um, always relatively soon. I mean, within the next three or six months, something like that. Uh, I don't know exactly when I'm going to uh, the Northeast next month. So I'll have yeah. to, I drive everywhere. I'll make my way back down to Texas and then oh, uh, uh, probably four to six months I'll be yeah. in Vancouver area. Uh, yeah. and I'll definitely get in contact with you guys, but we should, uh, at that point, we'll do another podcast and do some other videos, print footage, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we, if we start to, if we do this, uh, small house print, like we let you know, like, um, for sure. Like, yeah, I'd love to stop by. And in the meantime, just get as much footage as you guys can. And like even shorter videos, I know this is going to sound crazy, but you should make a TikTok account and <laughs> post TikTok videos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to work. Uh, you're right. Uh, what you no, say is not, right. So it's not gonna... crazy at all. We just no, no. haven't been. Neither of us are. Um, what's the word? Experts at, at social media. So I mean, he, was I. Emmanuel is more than I am. But we we need to find somebody who's really into that stuff. To, to, to tell you the truth, like off camera on somewhere, like I work with John about like six, seven hours a day. I have my own place. I build another four or five hours a day, and I have to do some computer work or stuff like that. Plus, so you like you have you see a day like about 14 hours of like working quite intensely so like i have to get to that social media things and my nature is i'm a hot dog guy so well, here's the thing i bet you're already taking videos to send to your friends back home your family so you no, have the like, videos very, already very little, like I'm, I'm not a guy like that i don't put myself on like or whatever but we have we have plenty of videos yeah right? you have it's just a question of posting yeah them. and to organize them and so we have yeah. to go that way because what you're saying is wisdom you're completely right about it yeah and just we have to take the time to do it yeah the youtube video especially when you're editing in other footage together uh it's much more effort a TikTok video you can just take your phone off click go it takes 11 seconds okay yeah i don't i never even like watch a tiktok yeah I, I don't know <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna do it content. we're gonna do it because you said it so yeah. we're gonna check that you yeah. should definitely do it maybe you have like a niece nephew or grandchildren or something that you can show you how it works and uh it's yeah. it's a good thing uh, just make it keep it easy don't put too much thought into it just put the videos in the internet and see what happens okay yeah thanks for okay. the advice yeah, thanks we're yeah cool it. well uh yeah Lots of footage, and we'll stay in touch. I can't wait to see what you guys uh, get up to printing next. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, how you figure you. out how to delete the rotor stator for good. <laughs> yeah. yeah right. We're going to do it. Yeah. All right. Until like, next time. We, know, later we have some on. idea, but we're going to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.